Hi, my name's Nolan. I'm a uh, software engineer at Jane Street. I've been here for about six and a half years. And I'm Grace, also a software engineer at Jane Street, and I've been here for about two and a half years. We put together this mock interview uh, because we know that interviewing is a stressful process and people come in with different expectations. Um, so we'd just like to show you what a Jane Street interview might look like and share some advice. Well, we hope that uh, at least some of this advice will be useful for any tech interview you do. Uh, we're both Jane Street employees, we interview for Jane Street, so we do expect that some of the advice is going to be specific to our own interview process. So the video itself is composed of a mock interview, followed by uh, us doing a recap of the interview. Uh, you can find some of the timestamps in the description below if you'd like to jump around and take a look. Hey, my name's Grace. I'm calling from Jane Street. Uh, is this Nolan? Hey, Grace. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Nolan. Awesome. Nolan, it's nice to meet you. Uh, we were scheduled for an interview around now. Is now still a good time for you? Yes, now is great. Awesome. Um, and since we'll need it for the bulk of the interview, are you next to a computer with internet access? Yes, I am. So why don't I go ahead and read you a link that'll get you dropped into the shared editor we're going to be using for the interview. Um, and we'll make sure that our technology works and we can kind of talk about the shape of the interview. Great, yeah. Um, so just let me know when you're ready to type in the link. I'm ready. Awesome. So it's cpad.io slash 6005. Cool. I think I am in. Um, awesome. I think I see your name at the bottom. Yes. Um, can you just type something to make sure that I can see it? Awesome. Cool. Uh, do you see that I've typed yes. response? Sweet. Uh, so our technology works. Uh, that's great news. Uh, so a couple of things before we jump into this interview. Uh, the bulk of the interview today is going to be us working through a question in this shared document. Um, I'm sure this is not how you normally write code. Uh, it'd be surprising if you normally wrote code talking to a stranger on the phone in a web browser. Um, so a couple of things to try to make that a little more pleasant. So first off, please write in whatever language you're most comfortable in. Uh, there's syntax highlighting for a lot of popular languages in the upper right corner of your screen. And if you want to write in one that's not there, that's fine too. Um, so you should feel free to change the language uh, cool. yeah. to whatever you prefer. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and use Python 3. Awesome. Sounds great. Um, so another thing to note is that we're not going to be running your code. So while I'd like you to write real code, um, so code that given a compiler or interpreter, you can make run. If you do the equivalent of missing a semicolon or something like that, that's totally fine. Um, and similarly, I'm not expecting that you have the standard library for your language of choice memorized. Um, if you forget the name of a common library function that exists, just say something and we'll agree on a re reasonable API for that function. Sure. Sounds good. Uh, awesome. And then one last note is just kind of like high level advice for what I'm looking for. Um, we really value clear and correct code here. And so by default, I'd like you to focus on that over writing super efficient code right off the bat. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to make your code fast. And I'm always going to be happy to come back and ask you to make something faster if I'd like you to. Um, just that by default, I'd like you to focus on clear, readable implementations. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking about like code structure, variable names, things like that. Cool. Sounds good. Cool. Awesome. And I'll leave a chunk of time at the end of this for any questions that you've got for me about the interview process or Jane Street more broadly or whatever's on your mind. Um, but otherwise, do you have any questions about what I just described before we get started? No, nope, no questions about that. Sounds great. Awesome. So let's jump into it. Today, we're going to be dealing with unit conversion. Um, and specifically, I would like to ask you to write a program that can answer unit conversion questions, like how many meters are in an inch, uh, given a big list of conversion facts about units. So by way of example, I'm going to paste in some example facts and queries. Uh, in the coder pad. So a few things to note. So the top has a list of example facts, and the bottom is like a list of example queries that you can you could be able, you might be able to answer in this way given those facts. Um, you don't have to do any parsing, so I'm going to pass the facts to you as string float string tuples, and the query is a float string string tuple. Uh, got it. Okay, cool. Yes, makes sense. Cool. 
Um, so, um, do you have any thoughts on how we might be able to kind of like write yeah. a function that will be able to answer these queries given those facts? Let me think a little bit about this. So, what are we going to want to do? We're going to take in all of these facts. Are there kind of like two different steps? Like, should I expect to kind of write a function like, you know, parse facts, something like this, that returns something, and then um, answer query, query facts, or something like that? Like, is this a kind of a reasonable thing? Or uh, would you yeah, rather that I, I kind of parse this... the facts every, every query? Uh, I think this seems reasonable. Uh, cool. What do you think? Uh, I mean, this seems Would a little you nicer. To parse the facts? Um, just so that I can do some pre processing up front to kind of make answer query simple. Uh, I guess I could do that every time, but it, it seems a little nicer to, to do all of that work once. Um, so let's think a little yeah. about what type of work we want to do here. Um, I guess, like, conceptually, we have a couple of different, like, disjoint graphs. Right, like there's the like distance graph and the the duration graph in this question and or in in your example. And um, what do you mean by graph? Yeah, so like we have um, one node in our graph is is maybe meter, and we have an edge between meter and foot. Um, and that edge has some annotation indicating that a meter is is equal to three point two eight feet similar for feet to, to inches. Um, and then, I mean, maybe we have like one big graph and it's just not fully connected. Um, but we have kind of a separate um, series of connections between hours and minutes and minutes and seconds. Right? And I think like this. Gotcha. It, it, so. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to confirm. So parse facts is going to take that list of facts and like return some sort of like set of graphs or graph. Um, is that is that what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm mostly I'm thinking about like I think at a high level, like let's imagine that everything was connected here. Let's imagine that there is no uh, duration. Then like our mm -hmm. algorithm is like pick some arbitrary starting point. Maybe we could be clever about what that starting point is. Um, and but like pick some node in this graph. Um, oh, I, I, I sorry. Very clearly, never mind. We pick the node that is equivalent to like t uh, meters here because we're answering the two meter question. And then kind of uh, uh, do some type of like BFS or DFS. I don't actually know off the top of my head which would be more appropriate here. Um, and keeping track of the state stored in our edges until we find um, our inches node. And then apply some conversion based on that state, multiplying like 2 by the various floats that we've stored at that edges to get 78.72. And I guess like when doing that, the thing we want to do is. Um, or, or, or I guess like if we explore um, every um, node that's connected to meters, and um, at no point um, do we find inches, uh, which I mean isn't going to happen, but like this does happen with inches and hours, then we want to return not convertible instead. So I think like actually the state that I want to store um, to start out is going to be something like a dictionary that maps strings units to some class that represents a node and a graph. And then those nodes in the graph will store like um, nodes store like a um, float node tuple, um, where float is kind of the, the way that we want to convert between um, the node that we are operating over and the node that we're linking to. Um, and the node that we're linking to is some other unit that we can convert to. So it stores some, like, you know, edges um, type of uh, class variable. Um, and then our algorithm is going to be take in um, a string, uh, look it up in the dictionary, do uh, some traversal over the nodes kind of stored in that dictionary, uh, and return an answer or not convertible. Um, I think there is a clever way to keep these graphs that we're building up as small as possible. I have this vague recollection of a thing called union find, but I don't actually really remember uh, how it works off the top of my head. Um, I would need to go look it up. Um, is it all right to 
kind of write the naive thing that I've sketched out here, or do you want me to do something uh, uh, a little faster? Absolutely. Let's go for the naive solution and see how that goes. Cool. And is the thing that I've described like somewhat reasonable? Does it make sense, or is it unclear? I think this makes sense to me at a high level. Um, okay. So you want to construct a graph that maps from uh, some units to some other units, and you're keeping track of, in your graph, what that conversion rate is. Does that sound right to you? Yeah. So let's maybe, cool. for the sake of being super explicit, we can make a edge class. Um, do you take self in Python 3? I don't remember. Um, multiplier. We can just go for it. Um, node. Self dot multiplier equals multiplier. Self dot node equals node. Class node def net self. Um, and we are going to take in like a what uh, unit. Um, so that's something like m or im self dot unit equals unit def add child or add edge self and multiplier and node other unit. Something like this, self dot multiplier plus multiplier, self dot other unit equals other unit. So um, hopefully, you know, maybe that's that's a bit of overkill, but hopefully that makes it a little clearer how I actually want to store this data. And then we're gonna, like I said, have some dictionary that tracks individual units to their node class. So um, you can call, call this whatever name to node, it's a dictionary for, and then you said this comes as um, unit, left unit, multiplier, right unit in facts, is that right? Yeah, that seems right. Float, or uh, string float string, or is it, yeah, okay. String float string, string float seems string. like a reasonable representation. Great. Okay, so um, let's see. What do we want to do? If left unit not in name to node, uh, equals node of left unit name to node left unit equals left node. So we want to do that if right unit. All right, this is surely there's like a nicer way to do this in Python, but I'd like to at least kind of sketch this out before I simplify it at all. Uh, and this is actually name to node, not name to name, which wouldn't make a lot of sense. Right unit equals right node. And then um, equal uh, dot add edge multiplier right unit, something like that. So I think this is like somewhat reasonable. I guess, yeah, OK. So I think that's fine. Uh, maybe I'll come back uh, for a second pass at that in a second. But we've got this facts dictionary um, mapping units to other units. And here, multiplier is something like 3.28 or 12. And the thing that I need to remember is to like multiply by it all the time and to never divide by it or something like that. I can imagine having a bug there. So now um, our query comes in as what? Float times left unit times right unit. So um, final multiplier left unit from unit to unit equals query. So I think my plan is just going to be to keep this final multiplier around 
and multiply uh, right at, oh no, never mind. Starting unit amount. So now what do we do? Um, let's have some, so we're going to kind of have some list that represents, how do we want to do this? Why did you change it from starting amount to uh, oh, starting Oh, right, amount? yeah. Um, I guess I didn't necessarily need to do that. Um, originally, I was thinking, like, I am going to have some state that I kind of produce um, at the end of answer query. And that will be, like, some set of numbers multiplied by each other. Um, and, or, sorry, like, mm -hmm. some list of numbers. And then I'll, like, multiply all those numbers by each other, and then I'll multiply it by starting amount. Um, but was thinking a little more, and was like, oh, it seems a little clearer to instead um, have like kind of multiply starting amount in real time. Like um, that is uh, instead of like keeping some list around or something like that. Like every time we kind of uh, traverse across some edge, multiply starting amount by by the value in that edge. So you just kind of keep a running total. Um, but I think what I actually want there depends on like how I want to solve the underlying problem here. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to think about that for a second. Um, OK, sure. so what do we want to do? I think like at a given node, We want to enqueue um, a tuple of like current amount and like unit to check or something like that. Um, what is unit to check? Yeah. So so let's see. Um, this is going to be like, uh, given we, we are at some node, it has some number of edges. We want to enumerate all of those edges. And um, for each of those edges, um, add some new tuple to a queue um, where that uh, tuple contains kind of the amount that we were already keeping track of times the amount encoded in that edge along with the uh, uh, node that that edge kind of links to. Um, when we do that, we want to be careful to um, not add nodes that we have seen before. So we're going to want some visited set. And I think also kind of saying all this out loud, we want to do this in kind of a BFS-y way, um, because the thing that we care about is finding a short path. Um, we don't want to take some convoluted path. Um, because we're like multiplying floats by each other, and the more we like multiply floats by each other, the more likely we are to run into like weird float rounding errors. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Cool. Um, so we're trying to write a BFS here, and you're now thinking about how to effectively keep track of like uh, the running product of these um, conversion rates. Does it? Yeah, right. yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so I, I think it's like it's a BFS, but it's it's a little funny because I think normally, at least I, I don't write that many BFSs, but but I'm not normally kind of trying to like keep some other state associated with like each different kind of conceptual unit in the BFS. Um, and, but but mm -hmm. here we are. So we want like a visited set, and that contains only units. Um, equals set, and I guess actually visited dot add from unit at the start. And I think, or in fact, maybe it's easier to do, how do I want to do this? I think I just need to like write out a couple of lines of code to see what this looks like. So um, oh, I didn't do this right. Let's take a step back. We want this node class to have some other edges. Starts out as the empty list. And 
other node. I guess that's already a node class. So self.edges.append multiplier other unit. We want to do something like that. Cool. And that way we can refer to edges. So like for um, edge. And I guess you probably want to make that and act you actually use the edge class there, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. Huh. Uh, edge equals I sketched these out to make my thoughts clear and then just totally failed to use them. Multiplier other. And let's just for explicitness, instead of calling this unit, call this node um, to make it a little more clear that it is a full on node class. So we're going to grab that. Cool. And then we're going to append edge like that. So we've got this edge in. Um, let's not do this. So the thing I want to do is instead have some queue that I'm going to be pulling off of, right? And I think the thing mm -hmm. that I want to do is to start by inserting um, from unit comma starting amount into that queue. Um, mm -hmm. And that way, my loop can be like, while that queue isn't empty. Otherwise, I'm going to have to like awkwardly prefill that queue with a couple of elements, and then after that, kind of iter uh, iterate over the queue for a long time. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think this sounds right. Cool. Um, I also don't quite remember what queues look like in Python. I think that there's a queue class in collections. Can I kind of import that and make up a reasonable API? Yeah, I think you should feel free to make up a reasonable API for a queue. You could feel free to use a list, and we can assume it's a queue. Up to you. OK, I'll do like a from collections import queue. I think it's capital. Um, so to visit equals queue. And let's not actually add from unit to the visited set yet. To visit dot push. Um, and so what did we say? Um, from unit starting amount. And then we can do while um, not to visit dot empty. Is empty? I don't know. Sure. <laughs> um, and we're going to say current amount current unit equals to visit dot pop. If current unit equals to unit, return current amount. Right. Yes, or print so answer equals, but presumably returning that or returning like none is maybe a reasonable API here. Yep, I think uh, that sounds Reasonable. Yep. And I think you like swapped your tuple a little. So I think it should be unit comma amount in your two visit set. Your two visit queue. Oh, you're totally right. Current unit, current amount. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. So either the unit is uh, the thing that we're looking for, or it's not. And if it's not, first we want to add it to our visited set. So visited.add current unit. Then for edge in current unit dot edges, um, if edge dot, and what do we call these? Node and multiplier. Edge dot node not in visited. If it isn't visited, we don't do anything. Otherwise, this amount, this is kind of a bad name. Uh, yeah. Amount, um, updated amount? I don't know. This is all kind of abstract and, and, and high level. Um, 
but we can say this is equal to current amount times edge dot multiplier. I guess we could say like with latest multiplier. And then we want to do to visit dot push edge dot node and uh, with latest multiplier. And there's something gross here, which is that if we see the same node many times here before we process that node once, we're going to add it to two visit many times. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I think, so like a gross thing that we can do is also say visited.add um, edge.node. Um, that feels gross to me because we're doing that twice. Um, maybe the right thing to do is to add this up here. And in special case, the first node. That seems reasonable. Yeah. Cool. So we're going to push that in there. And I think that's it. If it's invisited, we don't need to do anything. We've added all of the edges. Adding more stuff to 2Visit. And if we get out here, I believe we can just return none. Um, how does this look? Do you want to walk through an example? Uh, yeah, sure. So. Oh, well, there's something, one thing that we haven't done, I guess, like a pretty obvious thing, is we've never referenced facts. Um, <laughs> so we probably want to do that. Um, I think the relevant Seems thing reasonable. here <laughs> is that um, from, from unit equals, you can just do something like if from unit not, or in uh, facts, return none. To unit not in facts. Turn none. Otherwise, um, from. Oh, from is a keyword, so we'll continue using. Um, well, maybe I think it's it's maybe a, a little nicer in Python to not shadow that name. So let's do something like facts of from unit. And to node equals facts of to unit. We're going to update a couple of names here. Uh, to a node. Conceptually, I think, like, update all of these as well. Great. OK. Uh, so that was kind of a glaring omission. Um, otherwise, um, I think I'm mostly convinced that this parse facts is correct. Um, so I guess I'll focus on answer query. Um, we come in, we get a query. Let's say that it is how many uh, inches are in two meters. And I'm going to be scrolling up and down a lot in order to kind of double check uh, the examples. Um, so actually, maybe I'll just paste in um, this stuff right above my code. That way, it's a little easier for me to do that. Sure. So um, we get in a starting amount, which is 2, a starting unit, which is m, and an ending unit, which is inches. Both are in facts, because we've seen them referenced up here. Um, we retrieve them from facts. We put. Current, oh, current unit is not defined um, from node. We put from node and starting amount. So that's meters and two into two visit. And we also put meters into the visited set. Then 
we pop off meter and two. Meter is not equal to inches, so this check doesn't fire. We enumerate our edges, and our only edge is going to be feet. Um, so we enumerate our edges, we get to feet, we add that to our visited set, we create a new multiplier, which is 2 times the multiplier associated with that edge, which is 3.28, so that's 6.56, I think. Um, and then add feet and 6.56, or whatever it was that I said. Um, we loop back up here. We're at feet now. Um, we received a foot equals 12 inches fact. So foot should have. Oh, you know what? One problem I'm going to run into. I'm not sure that I'm running it into it here. Into it here. Um, mm -hmm. But I think one problem that I am going to run into eventually is that this parse facts thing that I'm building up isn't bidirectional, and it should be. Yeah. That makes um, sense. So you're saying, like, can you give me an example of what that means? Yeah. So this first query that, that I was walking through, this was going to, I believe, return the correct thing. Um, because we fed mm -hmm. it meters is like meters to feet, and we fed it feet to inches. However, mm -hmm. I think when we did this 13 inches thing, inches would not have any edges um, because, well, we never thought to add them. Um, and so we would immediately mm -hmm. give up. Yep. And so what are you proposing changing here? Um, so I think that that means up on line 40 and 41, we want to do something like mm -hmm. name to node. Naively, this is all we need to do, right? Unit dot add edge one divided by maybe one point. I don't remember how Python three division works. Yeah. But um, hopefully, if I floatify everything, it does the right thing. Left unit. And so now we should be adding like when we add a foot is twelve inches, we also add that an inch is one point zero over twelve feet. And so things should kind of end up working out. Cool. Yep, I think that makes sense. So given one particular fact, you can it actually gives you kind of like uh, two con two conversion rates, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that before. But that um, that seems right. Cool, that makes a lot of sense. Um, cool. But otherwise, I think that we end up doing the right thing here. Like, like in the example we were walking through, we were in feet. We were enumerating its edges. Um, we would have gotten to inches. We would have done 6.56 times 12, which I can't do in my head. Uh, we would have pushed that <laughs> into our set, um, or into our queue. We would have popped that off. Current node would be equal to two node. They're both inches, and so we would return that amount. And I believe that um, the kind of reverse case, converting inches to meters, would now be correct. Cool. All right. So during a typical interview, this would be the point at which I would say, all right, thank you so much. Um, I said at the beginning of the interview that I would leave some time for questions, and now is that time. Um, we're not going to do that here with Nolan, because uh, he already works at Jane Street. So presumably, his questions about Jane Street have already been answered. Uh, so we'll just wrap up the mock interview here um, and dive into a recap of the interview. So to start out, let's talk about what we're looking for in an interview. At a high level, more than anything, we're trying to understand what it's like to work with you. Solving the problem is one aspect, but it tends to get overweighted. Some people get stressed out when they don't solve the problem flawlessly, or conversely, focus on solving the problem at the expense of everything else. And there are many different things that we look for. Uh, you don't have to be excellent at all of these things, but we are looking for some areas where you shine. Some examples of things we might look for include clear communication, code structure and clarity, design intuition, carefulness, updating to your interviewer's feedback, expertise in your field or language of choice, um, and of course, general problem solving skills. Now, we're going to dive deeper into a couple of those. So let's start by talking about clear communication. 
there's advice floating around on the internet that you should be constantly talking out loud during tech interviews. And we think this advice kind of misses the mark a bit because it doesn't tell you what the purpose of that communication is or what types of things you should be communicating to your interviewer. Communicating clearly helps you and your interviewer get on the same page. Um, this means that your interviewer knows what to expect and they can help you if something isn't going quite right. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you need to talk through every line of code as you write it, and it also doesn't mean that you need to write your whole solution in pseudocode or in comments before implementing it. You can do all of that if it helps you, but you should keep in mind that it will slow the interview down a bit, and there are often more effective ways to sync up with your interviewer. Uh, for example, communicating clearly might mean clarifying the question spec up front or talking through your solution before implementing it. We also acknowledge that talking out loud while thinking is difficult and is one of those weird interviewing skills. If this is particularly difficult for you, you should feel free to say something like, I'd like to think in silence for a bit. So another thing that we care about is clear and correct code. Correctness is important, but we also look for clarity. Amongst other things, that means whether the code structure is easy to follow, for example, in terms of clear control flow and useful helper functions, and whether it's readable, for example, in terms of good function and variable names. We care a lot about code clarity because it's really important when working in a large and shared code base. We want to make sure that there aren't corners of the code base that nobody understands and that it's really easy to dive into unfamiliar code and get started quickly. Yep, and in interviews, we generally don't look for code optimization unless it's part of the question. Straightforward solutions are typically better than clever ones. The best general advice we can give is to practice. Unfortunately, interviewing is a learned skill that takes practice. You're in a somewhat contrived setting that's very likely different from what you do and how you code day to day. Now, there are sites that offer practice problems for free, and we're going to link some of them in the description. However, those sites tend to focus solely on the algorithmic components of technical interviews, while, as we've said, we try to take a more holistic view. So when you practice, instead of just looking at the solution saying, yeah, I could have gotten that, we recommend setting a timer, trying to implement it yourself, and talking out loud like you would with an interviewer. Thanks for watching. We hope this was helpful.